team. partners in this, uh, DC Jobs with Justice, uh, DC Working Families, DC Fair Budget Coalition, Jews United for Justice, and the Restaurant Opportunity Center DC, Rock DC. And I'd also like to thank the First Congregational United Church of Christ uh, for uh, allowing us to use this, this space. Democracy's uh, political director, uh, Jerry Clark, who's an experienced debate moderator and is uh, going to, I'm sure, uh, run things flawlessly. Um, so I hope, I hope everyone finds this an enjoyable and informative evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. We're behind schedule already. Um, we have, uh, we invited and had RSVPs from nine candidates for the uh, at-large council seat. Uh, hopefully we'll have seven here any minute now. Uh, one we know of, Brian Hart, is going to be delayed. He is an uh, ANC commission chair who has a competing meeting and he has to be there for a certain period of time and he will be joining us later. Uh, the other candidate we had expected, unfortunately, called me today and advised that uh, she had conflicts and would not be able to be here, and that's in the box. So we will have about nine to eight candidates uh, for this evening's uh, forum. Uh, just a few brief comments. Um, I think you all know, or if you don't, you will now, uh, we try to run a very professional uh, event. Uh, this is not an occasion for uh, politicking, campaigning, whatever. It's an opportunity to hear from the people who may well be filling a couple of seats on our council. When you think about it, that's a big deal. Two seats on a 13-member council. Um, so we know we will have your cooperation, uh, and uh, we will have a very professional meeting. Try to hold your applause. Uh, after, until after this is over. It just takes up some more time that we need desperately to get through the questions. Um, we hope to have time at the end of the meeting uh, for some Q&A. There are index cards at the back of the room, uh, just as to the left as you go out. Uh, if you have a question you want to ask, fill out the card. Um, Please make it legible, of course, and please try to make it as short as possible. And uh, as I say, I hope we will have the time to do that. A couple of things to remember. One is to please turn off your cell phones or other devices that may interfere with uh, uh, the candidates' presentations. Uh, and I guess simply I will remind people that you know, there are two positions that are being voted on, uh, one uh, this fall in, in this election, and uh, doubling the importance really of it for all of us. Uh, we're going to begin by allowing each of the candidates to make an opening statement. Uh, we'll be just one minute long, and uh, we'll begin with uh, Eric Jones. Good afternoon. Um, before you start, let me just, I, what I'm hoping for in these opening statements is that candidates will focus on their backgrounds and qualifications and not policy issues. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Eric J. Jones. I am a native Washingtonian, born and raised in Washington, D.C. have lived in a war five my entire life, family with the River Terrace. I have an undergraduate degree in marketing from Morehouse College, Master of Science in Finance, and for the last seven years, I have had the honor of doing government affairs here in the city, working with the city council and with well, the last two mayors and the last three city councils, uh, working on policy and legislations here in the city. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Perrier. Yes, good evening. My name is Eugene Perrier. I'm the president of Ward 8. 
for the time I've been living here in Washington, D.C., I think we've seen a lot of growth and not a lot of development, and I've pretty much spent all my time here working for those who got the short end of that stick. I've been the co-founder of the Jobs Not Jails Coalition, working with our returning citizens and fighting discrimination. I've been a member of the Peace Breakers, not Peace, Peacemakers, Not Peace Breakers Movement. We're working with communities east of the river to stop violence. I'm working currently right now with the Subtenant Associations, helping them fight against displacement. I've worked in schools to help people people's PEPCO rates stay low. Ultimately, all I've really done for my time in the District of Columbia is try to make sure that people have an equitable chance. I've been able to inter interact with the government at multiple different levels, and I've seen its dysfunction, its aloofness, and quite frankly, its inadequacy for many of those who are lowest on the totem pole. And I'm looking to bring that experience and that desire and drive to the council. Thank you. Mrs. Silverman. Good evening. I'm Alyssa Silverman. And I'm running for this seat because I want to bring social justice to the council. I think this is an election, not just about where you stand on the issues, but where you've stood. I've stood with many of you when the Housing Production Trust Fund was cut, and I worked with many of you to restore that money with my work with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Last year, I came before you and said, I think we need paid sick days for restaurant workers so that when someone who works for a restaurant gets sick or their child gets sick, they can take a day off without repercussions. I stood with you then. We got it passed. A higher minimum wage. I stood with many of you because I feel in our city, if you work full time, you shouldn't live in poverty. And we got it done. Thank you. Courtney Stoughton. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Courtney Stoughton. I'm a sixth generation Washingtonian. I grew up in Shepherd Park and made the choice to move over to East of the River in Ward 7 in an economically depressed community called Deepwood. I am the mother of the most perfect five year old, Malik, who, uh, who I want DC to be better for. I grew up in an amazing city. I went to amazing public schools, and I want my baby to have exactly the same thing, but I want yours to have it as well. So I'm running for DC Council to do just that, um, to ensure that we improve public education, to ensure that economic development happens with us and not to us, and importantly, to ensure that job training programs actually do what they're supposed to do, and that is put people in jobs that pay enough for them uh, to live in this wonderful city. So I'm honored to be here with you tonight. I'm honored to participate in this debate with everyone uh, up here and with you as well. And what I want you to walk away remembering that above everything, I am a mother first. Robert Wayne. Uh, good evening. Uh, I hope there's some actual undecided voters here. Uh, but for those who don't know, I'm Robert White. My, my personal background is uh, one of a, a native Washingtonian, having grown up in this city in a working class family. Uh, and that is a personal experience and a passion that I bring uh, to everything I do in this city. Professionally, I'm an attorney and I work for Congresswoman Gordon for many years as her legislative counsel, addressing all kinds of public policy issues uh, that face our city day in and day out. So I feel very ready to join the council and hit the ground running. And I filter everything through my family so you can rest assured uh, that you have a champion on the council. Uh, Mr. Pitts. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for having us and welcome to all uh, folks who are running and showing the commitment. My name is Colin Pitts. I'm a labor organizer. I'm a small business owner. More importantly, as Courtney said, you know, I'm a family man. I've got two young kids. My wife is sitting right here in the audience. I'm running for D.C. because I will make this city better for everyone. As this city grows and prospers, I want to ensure that we all grow and prosper with it. I have invested in this city because this is my community. I invested in the city when I worked in the, uh, in the DC jails, trying to do public health care. I invested in the city when I worked in the schools to reduce teenage pregnancy. I've invested in the city when, as right now, I'm serving on the executive board of the DC Health Exchange uh, and helped construct the laws here, that now 50,000 people have health care who wouldn't have had it before. I've invested in the city because I love the city. And, uh, Mr. Hanger, your opening statement, one minute, your background and your qualifications. Well, good evening. I'm Graylin Hagler. Uh, I've uh, uh, 
been the pastor of Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ here in Washington, D.C. since 1992, so 23 years of history. But not only history of pastoring in the community, but history in terms of organizing in the community. Uh, you can look across the street from the church where we took on the Exxon Corporation in 1993 was trying to build a super gas station and instead we fought them to a standstill and today there's 69 units of subsidized senior housing on that corner instead of a super gas station which is what was Exxon and water. Also in terms of the history, uh, when we look around Washington DC today we do not see payday lenders. We do not see payday lenders because uh, we took them on and fought them in the streets. Uh, to make them toxic. They were charging people 3,000% interest, 1,000% interest. They were ripping money out of the community and people were not paying attention. And every time the city council turned around, they would exempt the payday lenders from anti-predatory lending legislation. That's what I'm running for, is to stop the play-to-pay culture that has gripped the Wilson building and to demand that there's accountability and that citizens of the District of Columbia are heard and respected and not just the lobbyists of business interests. Okay. Um... <coughs> Uh, when Brian Hart arrives, we promise that we'll allow him to have a brief opening state as well. Same as well. Uh, but I want to go ahead and get started on the questions. Um, some of these are going to be pretty conventional, but I hope you're all feeling energetic because we've got some that are somewhat different. Uh, and I hope they'll be fun. Uh, let me start with a conventional one first, not the content, of course, but uh, just in the style, and I'll call on it you uh, by name to, uh, to respond. I've mixed it all up, so don't expect it to be in any particular order. Uh, even under the new campaign finance law, by giving once from their personal funds and then again from corporate funds, business owners are subject to contribution limits that are double the limits that apply to individuals. Do you think anything should be done about this? Are you accepting corporate contributions to your campaign? Uh, one minute for each candidate, beginning with Mr. Pitts. Thank you very much for that question. Well, uh, truth be told here, I'm a small business owner. I have taken uh, corp uh, donations from other small business owners, like myself, hardworking, restaurateurs, retail workers, retail people. Um, I think this question is more just about getting kind of corporate money out. It's about what we're going to do about, our, one, about our system, and two, about really educating uh, the electorate. I've worked across this country on civil rights and voting rights issues, so I know how important an engaged and educated electorate is. If we really want reform, and that's what people want, they want money out because they want transparency, then we need to move to a New York style uh, uh, public uh, uh, finance election. Uh, that's the simple re re reason to do it, where we have a six to one match, uh, and we're funding candidates. We worked in New York for Blasio, that is why Blasio was mayor, and he could work here in DC. But beyond getting money out, the fear of having corporate money out of elections, we need to educate the electorate so they know who's taking money from who and who's making it. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Mr. White. Uh, yes. So, you know, I think what, what, what we all agree, and I, I think our common goal has to be, is that there is no substitute uh, for electing people to the council with integrity. That has to be our, our overarching goal. I strongly supported public uh, public financing for campaigns. It's something I uh, vocally supported here in my campaign. Uh, you know, I think that the step that the council took recently in their recent campaign finance legislation went a very long way to closing loopholes uh, that have been open for for a long time. Uh, what all, everybody in DC, I think, wants to see is an equal voice uh, for, for people across the city, and that has to be our, our shared goal. Uh, I do accept uh, donations from, from businesses. Uh, actually, some of our first donations were from good friends of mine who gave from their businesses because that's where they could afford to give from. And we're talking about $30, $50, $100 donations, which really is the foundation of our campaign. What we want to address is outside influence, and on the council, uh, that would be one of my number one priorities. Ms. Jordan. So I think probably the absolute worst part of running for office is having to raise money. And I think a public financing model that um, gives the people a voice would be absolutely wonderful. I spent a significant amount of time on the campaign trail talking to voters who are concerned that because they don't have a thousand dollars to give me that when I'm on the council, I won't listen to them. So I think the piece about transparency, integrity, and accountability is of course of utmost importance. One, uh, the, the law that the council passed, I think Robert is right, that it did go a long way, but we can go even further. Um, and I think we have to have a clear sense of what interests are donating when they do donate and 
um, what they get from it. So there needs to be some um, tracking of how legislation is impacted and where their donations have, how their donations have impacted votes on the council. But I think what's critically important in thinking about a public advice, I think all of us actually would agree that we have limited interest in spending our time raising money to communicate with voters. We want to actually spend our time communicating with voters. So I, I think a New York model or a Connecticut model would both would work incredibly well. Ms. Silverman. Thank you, Jay. So I agree with Courtney. I think we can go further, and my campaign does go further. Folks, we've heard the window dressing of reform. I not only talk the talk about reform, I walk the walk. No, I don't take corporate contributions because it's about transparency, folks. LLCs, we don't know who these people are, and they abuse and exceed, some people, some bad actors, abuse and exceed <coughs> our, our individual contribution limits. And that buys access and influence in our system. It's time for that to end. I believe in banning corporate contributions. Many of you work with me on Initiative 70 to do that. We fell short. I think we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. It's time for the pay-to-play culture to end. I don't take corporate contributions, and that's why I walk the walk of campaign finance reform. Uh, Mr. Courier. Yes, well, thank you, Jerry. I also don't take corporate donations, and I think corporate donations should be banned in our political system. I also agree we should have public financing, but I think we have to be a little bit more honest here. I mean, first of all, you know, you cannot give from an LLC, but you can bundle for 20 of your friends and still raise $20,000 for someone and have undue influence. Because there's always going to be some form of loophole as long as there's haves and there's have nots and there are individual contributions, which, you know, the Supreme Court has says there has to be. So I think we have to look very carefully. I mean, it's not public housing residents who are flooding our campaign system with cash and making sure that we have all these corrupt decisions and no one can get a meeting but a lobbyist. It's big corporations. And so I think if what we really want is integrity and clean elections and people who are going to support an equitable government, we also have to look at those who cast a skeptical eye towards those who do the corrupting, towards those who are looking to influence the, influence the system unduly. And I think that's equally as important as anything you do from a legal perspective, but quite certainly we do need publicly financed election. Mr. Jones? Thank you for the question. First off, I think it's very hypocritical for most of the folks at the table to sit here and talk about transparency. The only person at the table who has not accepted money from a corporation or a lobbyist or called an actual one is Mr. Kruger. Everyone at the table has. So for us to talk about transparency and honesty, it's a joke. Yes, I accepted corporate contributions. The fact of the matter is we want to end the paper play caution. Let's take the care of the way. Our council has never voted against a single contract that has come before them since they've had home rule. If we want to end paper play, remove the ability of the council to vote on contracts because they don't vote against them. They take the money from their friends, and then they vote the contracts. If we remove the ability and create a real procurement process, we won't have the ability to drive council members. And that's what the real issue is. Funny enough, everyone talks about lobbyists. There's never been a lobbyist indicted for campaign corruption in this city. But there have been politicians who take from small businesses, medium-sized businesses, individuals who are lobbyists who get personal contributions. Here, here's where the corruption has come from. But no one wants to talk about the real issue. We want to give these sexy statements that sound good, but are unrealistic. Mr. Tanner. One of the things is that people are engaged in a lot of slogans and a lot of cliches. You know, the, re the reality is, is that there's somebody in my neighborhood who runs a business, been in that business for 45 years, been robbed 15 times. They've been robbed 15 times. They live in the community. Uh, they have a stake in the community. They've been in the community forever. They're a corporation. They should have a say in that community since they have decided not to go anywhere. They were there during the crack epidemic. They were there when things got good. They decided to remain there because they have an investment in the community. How dare we say that somehow they should be disenfranchised? Now, I believe, yes, that we need to have reform in terms of campaign financing. My, my proposal is tell everybody they can give whatever they want. They can give as much as they want. Put it into a common pool, though, and when everybody gets on the ballot, divide that money equally and no new money come into the race. The what it is will be what it is. Okay. I want to introduce you to one of the most important members of our team, Mr. John Zatoli, who you'll see at the front. He is the timekeeper for tonight and would help us try to get through all of this. So. I have arbitrarily assigned
members of this panel to teams. <laughs> we have Team A, and Team A is going to be uh, uh, consisting of uh, Mr. Jones, Ms. Silverman, and Mr. White. I'm going to ask a question. Each of you will answer the question. For this particular one, you'll have two minutes. Then the rest of the panel will each have a minute to say what you didn't say that you should have said or what you said wrong or whatever. <laughs> Try to keep it to the important things and not the nitpicky things, of course. Um, and then, after that's all over, we'll give the three team members 30 seconds each to rebut what was said about their, their presentations. Okay. So let's begin with um, Mr. Jones. Here's the question. The DC Council has passed several laws to improve wages, sick leave benefits, and protection against discrimination for workers in recent years. What will you do to ensure that these laws are effectively implemented? And what other laws would you support to further advance workers' rights? So it's two parts. Implementation, implementation of what's been passed, what additionally do we need? First off, let's look at what's been passed. And a great example would be the wage theft bill. One of the problems in implementing laws in our city is we have national organizations that don't have a local stake in our city pushing policy issues. When you have that situation happen, you don't exactly address the issues before DC. If you look at the wage theft bill, there were 37 complaints of wage theft that were quoted before the council. All of them took place among two companies. What we did not do is bring in the rest of the companies or businesses within the city and talk about the issue. One of the things I believe is vitally important is we have all members at the table when we have a discussion. That's how we make sure it's implemented. We create legislation that everyone can buy in on, and we don't have one side hitting against another. As far as the legislation that I would look at passing, first of all, let's look at real wage issues. One of the problems we've had with the several different discussions about the living wage and minimum wage is we carve out, we carve out different groups of individuals. If we're going to have a discussion, I want to start with including everyone, not excluding small business or excluding CBS or excluding McDonald's, or we're going to include Walmart because they're not union, but we're not going to include Safeway or Job because they signed a union contract. That's not realistic. It pitched one side against another, and it only gives some folks the ability to do good work. I want to look at making sure loopholes are closed and introduce legislation that includes everybody and everyone feels well about. That's why we don't see things implemented, because when we make these caveats, we go back to the rulemaking process six months to a year later, and those who have their car outs make rules that are unrealistic and can't be followed. That's why sick and safe for three years implement instead of being implemented right away. Because we have so many car routes and loopholes in it that it had to be thrown, thrown away almost before they could start over implementing. That's part of the problem. Ms. Silva. So we're answering the same question, Harry. Sorry? That we're answering the same question. Okay. Same question. Okay, yes. great. Okay, I was unsure what teammates' role was. So, so folks, I'm, I'm labeled the wonk and the nerd and just lop on a few other uh, words of, of those themes. Um, but I think that oversight is not just a good government thing. It's about saving people's lives, helping people earn a living. Uh, and, and I'm running on the council to do that oversight and implementation. Uh, and, and I am someone who testifies every year about the Department of Employment Services, which is charged with implementing and enforcing our wage and hour laws. And here's what I've noticed. A, we don't fund it properly. B, the folks who work for that office don't know what their job is because there aren't um, standard operating procedures in our Depl uh, Department of Employment Services. Uh, C, we need to implement these laws better and, and enforce them and oversee them. And that's what I'm going to do on the council. I'm going to, using you know, my power on the council, I'm, during the budget process, I'm going to be asking the director of the employment, Department of Employment Services, do you have the adequate staff that's needed to enforce wage discrimination law, wage theft, as well as the minimum wage and paid sick days? How are you doing it? I'm going to ask for data about that. 
You know, I know this is all unsexy and this is why I'm labeled belong, but I think this is a key role that the council plays. Doing the, the careful oversight, asking the key questions, going back to make sure, think, sure, sure things are implemented, um, and making sure that our laws work properly. That, that's what I would do. Mr. White, same question. Thank you. I, I, I think, you know, the proper role of the council is, you know, unfortunately, one, one thing that we've seen too much of in this city is folks getting city funds, uh, being bad actors and continuing to, to get city funds. And that's something that, that, that we have to put an end to. This is a matter of accountability. Uh, you know, the council does have a, a strong role, a, a strong oversight role, uh, to make sure that we are enforcing uh, the laws that, that we put in place. But what we cannot continue to have are people taking advantage of, of this city, take people taking advantage of, of residents. So the Armory Council is going to be in its oversight role uh, with me, uh, more similar to, to how, ex how Congress exercises its oversight role. Uh, what you're going to see is a, a mini-series of waste, fraud, and abuse hearings. Uh, that's something that I worked on for many years under Congresswoman Norton, something that I think we need to uh, do better jobs of in the council. We don't just bring agencies in when it's time to go over budgets. We have to bring them in periodically to make sure they are enforcing. And I think one of the uh, biggest enforcement problems with our, with our wage uh, and sick leave issues is that DOF, DOES is not uh, funded at, to have an enforcement arm, which is something that we have to correct. Okay. Um, now, before I unleash the attack, the attack dogs, just want to make one up. You don't have to take all the time. <laughs> and furthermore, if you think that everything's been said that needs to be said, say so. We can, we can use the extra time. I'm not expecting to get very far, but, but I better say it. Okay, um, Ms. Stone. Oh, I didn't think you were going to come to me first. Well, thank you, Jerry. Um, so I, I, th I actually agree with a good amount of what has been said. I think two major issues exist for this council in terms of fixing the problems around, around uh, wages and paid sick leave and all of those uh, fun policies that really impact people who live in the community in which I live the most because so few, so many in my community on Ward 7 and East of the River are un and underemployed and don't have jobs that provide the level of um, uh, support paid in terms of wages, um, doesn't, don't have uh, paid sick leave, um, and are hourly uh, jobs. So I live in a community where um, the vast majority of people are not exactly quite like me. And so here's what I think needs to happen. One, we need to ensure that DOS does have an enforcement arm, but importantly, we need to reorganize DOES from top to bottom um, to focus significantly on making sure that we're training people appropriately for jobs that actually pay a living wage. And at this point, DOES is not doing that. We need to step that up. Um, but I think the biggest piece, and I agree with my colleagues up here, is that the council has done a pretty terrible job on oversight. That was hard. Ms. <laughs> uh, year. Yes. Well, you know, I think the very fact that we're all sitting here talking about what all the problems are assigned that really is not really the issue that the council doesn't have enough oversight. It's that the council doesn't want to do anything about it. They know that they need to fund things. So they choose not to. But I have to be 100% honest with you. I think we need to change the entire paradigm of how we enforce these things. I mean, the reality is, is that people who are living in poverty, you know, you could be dealing with a, a wage an hour complaint at the same time the landlord is trying to kick you out, and at the same time you're still trying to find a job that you're getting discriminated against because you're a returning citizen. What we need in D.C., which is allegedly a human rights city, is a Department of Human Rights that ends the organization between the Office of the Tenant Advocate, the Office of the People's Council, and all these other enforcement brings them under one roof and has an elected public advocate who is the head of that department who will go like a junkyard dog after all these people who are out here trying to steal people from people from the and everything else that they're doing. And I don't think there's any other way we're going to do it as long as it's separated over 18 different offices because it's really the same people who have all the problems. Ms. Pitts. Uh, thanks. You know, hey, it's hard to follow your genes sometimes. <laughs> you know, you know I mean, we've said it here. It's enforcement accountability and actually putting teeth to that as you do. But it's not only about, you know, kind of the punishment side. It's about what are we going to promote? I didn't hear anyone here talking about promoting good businesses that treat their workers right. What does the city do about promoting businesses that treat their workers right? And second, what does the city do about, particularly with public money, about 
punishing or not giving funds for those businesses that don't treat, that treat their workers right. Part of city government is creating an environment for success. Success for businesses, success for people, success for the city. Mr. Heather. Every corporate entity in the city understands that. They can sign any document promising anything because no one is ever going to hold them uh, accountable for whatever they sign. So first source, for example, is never ever enforced. Uh, and that has a very negative impact. When you look at also what takes place in the city, uh, I'll give you a prime example. We're all marching around what went on in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, because the one is the police department had no relationship with the community. When you look at the D.C., the Metropolitan Police Department in D.C., you realize the majority of them live outside the city, and they have closed out, they have closed out our young people from applying to be a member of the MPD by saying that you have to have 60 hours of college credit in order to apply. You can go to Af Iran and Afghanistan and Iraq and risk your life for your country, but you can't apply for the MPD to serve your community. That's a travesty, that's a shame. We need to enforce things all around and open the door so that our people who are raised and graduate from our high schools can truly serve the communities that they were raised in. Um, I gather Mr. Hart has not arrived yet, so let's move on to the next question. And this is going to be... I'm sorry? You want us a 30 second rebuttal? We'll go back. Oh, I'm so sorry. I moved too, too quickly. Um, all right. Uh, the team members have 30 seconds now to uh, go, go back at what was said about that, the position. Okay. Well, really quickly, I heard a lot of talk about DOES. Most folks come to that. The DOES is actually well funded. The problem is not funding the DOES. The problem is accountability in the OES. It is actually having individuals on our council who understand workforce development, who understand job placement. And by the way, we're having there have been 27 cases of folks being fined and penalized for first work by the OES. It's happened over the last three years. So uh, there, there is enforcement. Unfortunately, we don't talk we don't talk about it enough because we don't actually have folks in place who understand what they're doing with the council, who actually come from the industries that are being impacted. And funny enough, how can we have a council that talks about punishing businesses when our own government doesn't meet the rules and regulations that they pass on a regular basis? Ms. Silverman. In the interest of time, Jerry, I'll let my prior statement stand. Thank you. <laughs> It's right. Thank you. Uh, no, just just a small point of clarification. I think uh, Mr. Perrier's point was apt, uh, but we do have an office on human rights. An office has a which is also understaffed and doesn't have enough people there, which is why it's going to have a negative effect in terms of returning citizens. Okay. Now, moving on to the next question, uh, calling out Team B, which will consist of uh, Mr. Pitts, Mr. Per, per year, and Ms. Stone. You'll have uh, two minutes each to address this very simple question. Is DC's rent control system working? <laughs> <laughs> if not, what do you think needs to be done? I say here to improve it, I should say to make it work. And uh, Mr. Fitz, you're first on this. Right? Yes. Sorry. No, that's okay. Look, uh, as everyone laughed at this question, I think we kind of know this. We're seeing in DC uh, uh, what people are experiencing around San Francisco. You know, uh, a housing crisis where working families, not even the poor, but the working families, uh, can't stay in their apartments, can't stay in the city limits. Uh, whether we're talking about fully funding the housing trust, whether we're talking about holding developers accountable uh, for building um, uh, affordable housing in their units, uh, whether we're talking about the city and how they uh, enforce these things, that is what we're talking about here. You know, uh, moving forward as a city, I think we need to address a couple things here. I think one, um, we need to build more affordable housing, you know, and not ghettoize the housing as we allow developers to do when, and I think the contracts are coming up, mostly the 20, 20 year contracts are coming up, and they want to get away the housing, move it to certain different wards or certain locations. We can't let that happen. Second, we need to figure out ways that we're looking at working families and making sure they stay you know, in their homes, uh, they're renting, and have the ability 
as we talk about, it's not just about rent and housing, it's about jobs and good paying jobs because we want to create those ladders of success so that someone can start here and move up here in terms of economics, but also someone can start renting an apartment. Hopefully they can buy maybe a condo. Maybe they can then buy a house. Uh, maybe buy a bigger house when they have a family. That's what the city government should be focusing on, is how do we move that ladder of success for individuals uh, within the city? Mr. Yeah. Yes, well, I, I think the rent control law certainly, it, not only is it not working, it's really a fig leaf. I mean, we have to look at a number of different problems. I mean, first and foremost, it only covers buildings built in 1976 or before, which leaves out a huge amount of housing stock. Second, the way it's calculated, which is CPI plus 2%, if you have that CPI plus 2% over 20 years, that's going to triple the rents. So it doesn't actually really control the rents. So what's the point of having a rent control law if it doesn't uh, really actually control affordability? Just CPI in 20 years would double the rents. And so you see what the, the significance is, it's not really rent control. And then finally, you have this issue where landlords are guaranteed a 12% return and the so-called hardship petition, which is uh, it's one of the most absurd things I've ever seen. I mean, if you have a money manager walk into his office tomorrow and ask him for a 12% return every year and watch him laugh you right back out of the office. I mean, quite frankly, we don't have a rent control law. We have a keep landlords rich law. What we need in D.C. is a real rent control law that covers every single unit and that takes into account that cost of living is dynamic and it needs to be set by fiat over a certain period of time so we make sure that rent is controlled in a way that maintains our affordability in a way that is actually germane to what the actual rise in the cost of living is so that our housing stock doesn't continue to get depleted. Because listen, when we lost that 50% of affordable housing in 10 years in D.C., renters' income stayed exactly the same. So rents can triple. I guarantee you working people's incomes aren't going to triple unless we raise the minimum wage. Yes. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Look, I think our rent control laws are non-existent, right? It's actually 1975, 1976 um, that are subject to rent control restrictions. Um, and how many new buildings have you seen all over this city? Um, so absolutely, I think we need to, to adjust what are incredibly outdated rent control laws. But I think the issue around affordable housing is an important one because so many people are being pushed out of the city in each and every single ward. Um, and this is an issue that, again, I see all too often. Um, I, I think many of us would love to live in these wonderfully new developed neighborhoods that have retail and grocery stores and coffee shops and restaurants everywhere. And many of, of us are being pushed out further and further out into the city where development has not taken hold, where things haven't uh, happened in, in a way that um, meets the needs of, of the community. And I think that's a piece we need to talk about. But beyond talking just about affordable housing, which I agree with completely up here, uh, with what has been said up here, we really need to talk about wages and job training and getting people in the jobs that will allow them to pay rent. Here's the unfortunate reality, folks. Rent is going to continue to go up in this city. Housing prices are going to continue to go up. Now, there are things that we can do. We can put more money in the housing trust fund. We can uh, provide more rent support to renters. Um, we can create incentives for our first responders um, to move into the city and so that they live here, um, and teachers to live in the city, because I think that's a critically important piece that helps build community. But I think, importantly, what we really have to focus on is figuring out how we get people in solidly good jobs that help them pay to live in this city. Um, and I think an additional important piece is that we have to stop talking about affordable housing like it's happening. I remember when Clifton Terrace was purchased for how much? Does anyone remember? $11. And when I wanted to buy a condo in Clifton Terrace, the minimum low income requirement I think was around $65,000. Well, I was a hill staffer. I made $22,000 a year, which if you don't know, is $11, $100 bills a month. Mr. Hagner, what would you take issue with, add, it, add to, or whatever? Well, we all agree that rent control is not working. Uh, it's slanted always towards the, um, the landlord. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's typical because just about every other legislative act or piece or policy that has been created in D.C., there's always been a loophole that's been designed in it so that you do not hold the entities entirely accountable because it's just like you put together a hardship petition or a capital improvement petition and you can get all around the so-called regulations of, a, of, a, of, a, of rent control. But I want to say that we need to, yes, produce affordable housing, but we also need to keep public housing public. We need to expand it. We need to get the profiteers out of it. We should be ashamed of ourselves. We should be ashamed of ourselves when we when we, we 
form of Relish on Rod are ending up missing um, out of a shelter when in fact we got nearly 500 units of vacant housing, vacant housing that could be housing families. So we're playing games when we talk all of this stuff around affordable housing and what infrastructure is in place. And sisters and brothers, the thing that I understand is I want to go to the council. I want to go to the council because I don't want to fit in. I don't want to fit in with the structure, the culture that is existing there. I want to call people out and make the difference on behalf of the citizens of Washington, D.C. And so I've been taking it as some events to say I'm running the For Real campaign. I'm for real. The housing crisis is real. We need to declare we're in an affordable housing and a housing crisis. Here's what I'm going to do as a year council member. You know, number one, it's, rent control isn't the issue because affordable rental housing is disappearing in our city. And you, we can see it through the numbers. You can see it driving up Georgia Avenue. There being those old buildings that were under rent control are being converted to condo. They're no longer rental houses. First, I think we need to strengthen the office of the tenant advocate to let people know their rights as renters. So when a building is purchased, they know their rights that they have first right to purchase. Just I'll go through the list. $100 million guarantee every year in the Housing Production Trust Fund so we can build more housing. I want to put more money into local rent supplement. I want to put more money into rental assistance. That's what the council can do, but you need a laser focus, and you need to know the programs. I've spent the last five years working on these programs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jones. Well, I think we all know the programs that work, but there's many issues we're not talking about. The fact of the matter is we all know that we've come, we're supposed to bring 100 million a year into affordable housing. First of all, we need to stop using the word affordable housing and say affordable and workforce housing because they're two different things. Secondly, it's a little known fact that most folks want to talk about. The city can't find developers to actually build affordable housing with the money they're offering because developers don't want to deal with the city. We need to change the climate of how housing works. And third, we need to stop talking about giving folks affordable housing without giving them the education opportunities, as Mr. Pitt said, to improve their sales. Because no matter how many affordable housing units you build, if we're not improving the folks who need to make more money to be able to afford to stay in our city, they're still going to end up being pushed out long term. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the stats, all of these new glorious luxury apartments that are coming online, they're 70, 80, 90 percent leased. So unfortunately, somebody's actually in those homes. And every time somebody new comes in making a lot of money, that AMI creeps up. So affordable housing costs creeps up. So unless we start educating and giving our folks the opportunities to make more money and be productive members of our society, they're still going to be priced out no matter how much money we put into affordable housing. Mr. White. Uh, thank you. So I, I mentioned earlier I'm a native Washington. I'm a, I'm a fifth generation. But you know, unfortunately, I'm one of the only folks in my family still left in, in the district because of the cost of housing. Uh, for working class people. It's out of control. We all know it's an issue, but, the, but, but, but identifying the issue, I think, is not good enough. We really have to start identifying uh, solutions to these issues. We have some glaring solutions uh, looking us in the face, but we have to take urgent action. Uh, one of the things I've called on is that we need to invest a billion dollars into affordable uh, and workforce housing over the next five years. What we need to do with that money is focus on preservation, because there's no way that we can build uh, enough housing to keep up with the need, but we can preserve a lot more than we would ever be able to build. So when an, a building, when an apartment building goes on the market, it's not just the tenants that have the ability to purchase the building. The district has the opportunity to purchase the building under the district opportunity to purchase that. When the district exercises that opportunity, purchases the building, puts a covenant on rents to limit the rents in perpetuity, and we can keep more affordable housing than we could ever be. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, members of the team, Pitts, Perrier, and Snowden, any of you wish to uh, add anything? Or? Yes. Yes. That's something we want for Pitts, Perrier, and Snowden. Oh, ladies first, thank you so much. Um, so just uh, two things I want to add. Um, one, I think it's really critically important that we start to hold developers accountable, right? Too many of these deals we strike allow developers to build affordable housing. We let the, they, they say, well, let us put market rate housing over here in the places where we can get market rate prices. And oh, by the way, let's put some affordable housing over in uh, Ward 7 and Ward 8. Now, we need more affordable housing in Ward 7 and Ward 8 because our uh, incomes are much, much lower than other parts of the city. But what we 
we also don't need anymore of is affordable housing. Right? That thing comes so fast. I just want you people to know I'm sorry. It comes so fast. Ms. Fitz? So I just want to chime in with this one thing Robert said. You know, I think it's a good idea. But you know, we're all fighting for the city to do is, is, is you know normal public service picking the trash on time. I'm just a little bit concerned about investing so much in the city solving this issue by buying houses. I'm not saying a bad idea, but we just we got to produce as a city. And a second thing, I just you know again want to say, you know, we can't look at affordable housing in a box. We've got to improve the economy a lot, the economic lot for people in the city. And, and, and Eric said it's about education, about creating jobs, making rise the ladder, except for minimum wage jobs, the middle income jobs, and hopefully high income jobs. Job. You think about the Elton John song, you know, you know, I buy you a big house, we both can live. Everyone wants the American dream or the DC dream. And so we as a government should be helping that environment so they can buy the house they can both can live. Mr. Breer, anything more? I would just say quickly, I, I actually don't agree with one point Mr. Jones asserted, which is that developers don't want to build affordable housing in the district because they don't want to work with the city. I think it's not because they don't want to work with the city, they want to make the most amount of money that they possibly can. I mean, the whole thing is just a shakedown process. like it's an ATM machine to get some little bit of money to build their thing and then put the tiniest little amount of affordable housing and say, oh, hey, look how great we are. I think it's not about developers, and we need this executive to finalize the rules for the District Opportunity to Purchase Act so the district can start getting into the game and buying some of these low-income buildings like Mount Vernon Square over there in uh, Columbus County. But, but you know, things that the city could do is kind of create the table, you know, creating from the builders, and uh, labor, you know, things we're seeing in New York where labor unions have decided, you know, to take less wages than they normally would to help build affordable housing. I think there are things that the city can do to kind of build those relationships. Much like the government county, which is partnering with the, with the Housing Opportunities Commission to do just some of the things we're talking about, but rather than letting the city buy the property, they allow nonprofits who um, are stable enough and have the capacity to do it to do just that and uh, create a ceiling for affordable housing. I think that's something we should replicate. These simple questions somehow get through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another simple question. This time we won't use it to the verbs, we'll just go down the line as it were. Understated. What do you see as the top issues concerning the Metropolitan Police Department's relations with the public? How much time? We're just giving one minute. Your candidate for this, starting with Ms. Silverman. I think the biggest issue is community engagement. So a lot of you probably don't know that I was a prime reporter for the Washington Post. I worked the night shift from 6 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. And I spent a lot of time covering, unfortunately, murders um, that got one inch in the paper. Or one, I, I'm sorry, in the reporter speak, one sentence in the paper. Um, I think communication is the biggest issue. Uh, I think you always, no matter what meeting you go to, people want to see more cops on the street. Uh, I think we need to, number one, have better relationships. Ferguson's a perfect example. We need to have better community policing, which means that our officers are involved with you and, and you feel comfortable talking to them. I think we also need to deploy our officers much better um, using, using data <laughs> uh, to, to, to really address the crime hotspots. Uh, Ms. Stoughton. You just love me today, Gary. I love you back, so it's good. Um, look, I live, again, I've been talking about this. Look, my house has been broken into three times since 2011. I have cameras all around my house to prevent that from happening. I live in a community that has the best of what this city has to offer, but experiences some of the absolute worst of this city's crime. And the number of police officers on the east of the river is deplorable. It is deplorable. So a couple of things that we need to do, I think, immediately. One, I think we certainly need more police walking the street, building a relationship with community. So when crimes happen, police officers can get great information quickly. Um, and they actually will know the folks in the community, number one. Number two, I think it is true that we have to look at the data, but here's a problem with some of the data. Ward 7 and Ward 8 have some of the lowest 911 calls in the city and the highest amounts of crime. So if you follow the data, you will put more police officers in other parts of the city. Well, that actually doesn't make sense. Um, so what I think is critically important, and I want to just say, and I think the police department does a hell of a job of keeping us safe, but there's more that they can do. Mr. Hager. You can clap. <laughs> I 
think that one of the things that we have never understood very well, uh, and not only here but all across the country, and that is what really community policing is. Uh, we continue to be deficient in that. We've been deficient in that all across the country. Uh, and, and, and it comes back to also the place in terms of your officers having a relationship with the community. In other words, that they live in the community, that they are a product of that community, that they also have, have the opportunity to serve the communities in which they were raised in. Like I said earlier, we denied that opportunity to our young folks. At, the one, at one time we talked to our young folks about serving their community, and then we have policies in place that deny them the ability to serve unless they go off to the military. And we need to always address that issue of the militarization of the police departments, not only in Washington, D.C., but across the country, because there is this relationship which is an unhealthy relationship that prevents a police department from really being engaged in community policing. Mr. Um, Pitts. Chime in with the good rep just said, you know, we can put as more cops on the streets, uh, we can have them deploy, deploy in different areas, but as Reverend said, we need, unless we demilitarize our police department, just take a look at their uniforms right now, the, the, the menacing uniforms, and give them the sensitivity training, you know, we're going to continue to have problems, you know. I've been stopped on the street just because, I'm sure Aaron and Jean and Robert and Reverend Hatton are like, Courtney does too. You know, and Courtney, you know, just experience walking down the street fitting the profile, you know. I got pulled over with my wife one time doing that. So it's, it's again, unless we change the culture and the mindset of the police department, we can't, ch we, we cannot change the interaction what they have with the general public and the general public's relationship with the police department. Mr. White. Uh, I, I don't think that the D.C. Police Department is, is overly militarized given uh, its unique uh, jurisdiction in our country. I think that they do a great job. I think the rank and file officers in our city are tremendous. As president of my Civic Association in Brightwood Park, uh, when I emailed my PSA Lieutenant, Lieutenant Lamont, and asked him to come to a meeting because we've had a crime issue, he comes and he brings officers with him, which I tremendously appreciate. My problem is that when he shows up at the meeting and there's been a homicide in our neighborhood, they read the statistics and they say things have gotten better. Well, unfortunately, you know, if you lived here in the 90s, well, like I did, things will always be a little bit better than they used to be. So I think what we want to see, instead of a reliance on statistics, is a, is a reality that our police department can adapt to changes in trends and crimes in our neighborhoods so that we feel a little safer. Mr. Um, Jones. On Tuesday, while canvassing, uh, I stumbled upon uh, Officer Atkins, who was the 2013 MPD Officer of the Year. Uh, I asked him why he won the award, and he talked to me about a community engagement initiative that he created up in uh, the second district where he's at. He also showed me how he created that same initiative over in 50, where he lives, over in Precinct 69. He's soon to be retired and serving 25 years in the force, and one of the things I asked him is, how is the morale in MPD? How can we get more community engagement and get more folks to think like you? The first thing he brought up that we don't talk about enough is our police officers haven't had a raise in seven years, which has been promised to them, which we must deliver to them because it's vitally important. How are you going to have folks who want to engage in community if they're stressed about making ends meet? We talk about affordable living. How can we get folks to live in our community if our police officers haven't had a raise in seven years? The cost of living is going up every year, but they can't afford to be part of the communities that they serve and protect because they can't afford to live here. Let's give them their raise. Let's bring them back to the city. Let's give them programs to help them get work for out in the city. I remember growing up in Brooklyn and Officer Mike lived down the street. He kept it safe because he lived there. Let's bring that back. Hey, Mr. Breer, you get the last word on this. Yes. Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, we can't police our way out of the problem of crime, so we have to always keep that in the forefront. But secondly, uh, you know, you can't even really rely on the data because the MPD isn't keeping all the data. They don't record all their stops. They don't record every time they pull a gun like they're supposed to. And the reality is it's not just the culture and it's not just who it is. It's the tactics and the mentality that they have, the entire jump out boy phenomenon that's only east of the river, even though we know that west of the park has some of the highest marijuana usage of the entire country, not just D.C., but they don't use jump out boys over there, which if you don't know is military style thing where they just jump out of the car, they point a gun at you and it has a huge constitutional issue because six guys jump out of that car, they point assault rifles at you and they say empty your pockets, empty your pockets. They've completely violated your constitutional rights even though under a pretext they say, oh, well we actually got the thing, uh, we actually were able to do it. Whether it's a marijuana issue, whether it's a broken light, whether it's something hanging in your window, we've also seen from what the ACLU has done in a positive way and what will come out 
in the hearing that's happening on October 9th about these issues. There's a massive amount of pretextual stops. And the whole reason they don't record all the data is because the NPD is trying to hide the fact they have a de facto stop and frisk program. They just call it marijuana odor or something wrong with your car. And they're only doing it They don't just do it East the River. Come to, come to Fifth District. They do it in Trinidad, Truxton Circle, Bloomingdale. Uh, they do they do it in the parts of the city. Well, it's an even worse problem than I'm talking about. I live in Ward 8, so that's how I know. But that's the reality. <laughs> OK. Um, again, uh, Mr. Hart is not here. Um, so I'm going to modify the plans a little bit. Um, I'm going to skip over this question and go to the next one. We'll come back to it because he's supposed to be here in just a couple of minutes. Um, again, this is one minute question for everybody. Um, what concerns do you have, if any, with the agreement the administration negotiated with the owner and developer to build a new soccer, soccer stadium in D.C.? Okay, what concerns do you have, if any, with the agreement the administration negotiated with the owner and developer to build a new soccer stadium in D.C.? Mr. White? Uh, I'm sorry, there's a question. Last well, one, I'm just so ready to answer that one. Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll get your chance. Thank you. My, Mr. My, White. Yes, my, my, my issue is, is what is still a significant lack of I think that you know we, we can't as a public uh, make a, a an informed uh, decision on, on this without knowing the evaluation for the Green Center, uh, without having a better understanding of how transportation is going to work. I don't know if any of you have driven down uh, in Street Southwest or rush hour, but it's already a traffic jam. So we don't know what we're going to do with that. Uh, the other thing, we can't proceed with an assumption that because you move workers from the Green Center to Anacostia, uh, that that is going to uh, promote development in Anacostia. I think that we have to have some solid uh, financial background information in order to make an informed decision. Ms. Stoughton? Thank you. So, look, here's the deal. There are three, three things that I want to say in one minute, Lord. Here we go. Uh, one, this deal is incredibly complex, but here's what I know. The Reef Center, prime real estate, that should go out on the Namely, look at National Park. 
right, uh, that deal that was put into place. No transparency there whether we actually got a fair deal for that. Uh, when you look at it, it does not really, really benefit in terms of even its utilization of people from Washington, D.C. because people come from every place else in order to use that stadium. And then you come down and you talk about the Reef Center. My, my position is, is that things that are public need to remain public and we need to find another use for it. Uh, it needs to remain public and to exchange the Reef Center for a toxic waste dump where cars have been abandoned makes no sense on the surface, let alone when you look at the numbers, it's probably going to stink the high hat. Ms. Jones? Well, let's be honest. We look at this soccer scene proposal. It was a campaign ploy to try to get somebody who re-elected who lost the race. Let's be brutally honest about it. It came out the year before the election. We had a baffling deal with the Metropolitan Washington Council of AFL-CIO to ensure that all of the workers would come from union halls outside the city who are signatory to the agreement. We made a deal with developers who would only take a small percentage of the risk to make a lot of money. We then told the soccer team, we're going to give you $150 million and then ensure that you don't have a loss on your contract. And to make things even worse, when the city government put out the contract, they left out half the information to come review it. This was a bad deal from the beginning. It was all a campaign ploy to try to get somebody reelected who's on their way out of office. So I'm going to get the entire deal. It all needs to be scrapped and blown up. So I think I may be the only person up here who's actually testified at Darrow Bowser's hearing she did a couple months ago. You know, Let's just say we convert it. We a poor, the city has proven a track record of doing a poor job and in investing in large the, the development. So we need to, you know, the process needs to be transparent so people can take, take a look. Uh, second, uh, I think I'm the only one here who's going to be directly impacted what's going to happen in Reef Center, both from a commercial standpoint as a residential standpoint. Now, I may disagree with you, Courtney, about putting out in the open market because one of the things that's happened is the residents and the business owners in that on 14th Street and U Street have not been involved in the process. What they want to happen to the has not been heard. Mr. Perrier. Yes, well, I, I'll say I, I also testified along with Jerry Clark and Debbie Hanahan and Mr. Jones here and several other people at the very first uh, hearing that was held about the soccer stadium issue, so I've been out there as well. I'm opposed to, to the soccer stadium, not in the general sense. I think if DC United wants a stadium, they should pay for it and they should build it. Uh, <laughs> I just think that there, there's too much of a culture in this country and in this city of people who have the money to build things going to the city and demanding the money to build things and then putting a gun to our head and saying, well, if you don't do it, if you don't give us this money, we're never going to do it. I mean, I don't look at that as development. I look at that as a terroristic attitude, and, and I, don't, I don't negotiate with terrorists. I'll take that. You know, further and first and foremost, though, I also will do want to pick up on one thing that Alyssa is saying. We have a lot of reporters here. I think it's very important that reporters look at this one property, 1350 Alabama Avenue Southeast, where there's currently a displacement effort going on right now to put up luxury office space as part of it. And when we haven't heard anything about how they're going to build this reef center in Southeast, I think we need to look very closely at how these different pieces and these different deals that are working together. Please look into this, 1350 Alabama Avenue Southeast, right about it. Okay, at this point I'd like to take a slight break from the routine and introduce our newest guest tonight, Brian Hart. Uh, Brian, would you like to take a minute and introduce yourself, talk about your background and qualifications, and then we'll move on to more questions. Absolutely. Uh, I was at an ANC commission meeting, I'm an ANC commissioner at Adams Morgan, and I'm chair of the ABC and Public Safety Committee, and that's why I was running a little bit late tonight. Uh, we were dealing with some issues in our neighborhood with respect to car break-ins and vandalism and also uh, some violence activities on 18th Street. Uh, so I apologize for, for being late, but uh, I thank you all for being here and I thank uh, DC for Democracy for hosting this event and I'm happy to be here with my fellow candidates. We're happy to be here too. <laughs> thank you. You know, I'm, I'm running because I believe in justice and equal opportunity and transparency. And I believe there's a real lack of that in our city. And, you know, I've worked um, during law school and after law school, I campaigned for President Obama. Since then, I worked very hard as a public interest attorney in the city, as a teacher and mentor of Lagoon Anacostia High School, and also as an ANC commissioner. I've seen firsthand those issues, and I'm gonna fight very hard for those. Uh, those principles and those values are collected at the DC Council. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, now we're going to go back to the question we skipped over, which we needed you for. <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, a concept that we we're trying out tonight for the first time, which we have team members take the lead on a particular question, and then the other members of the panel get to uh, critique the uh, members of the team. Self-inflection of rumors. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're going to have team uh, C, which should be three people, but since Ms. Bonds couldn't join, so this is going to be two. It'll be Mr. Hagler and Mr. Hart. And you'll have each two minutes to address the following question, after which the rest of the panel will have a minute each to talk about what you've said or haven't said. Um, the district has adopted a number of educational reforms in recent years, yet although the data shows some improvements in student performance, they seem on average to be fairly small. Is there something important missing from our reforms or not yet kicked in? Are we even using the right student performance measures? Mr. Hagler. Well, something is drastically wrong when we talk about educational reform in Washington, D.C., because the reality is, is that those who are high income, those white students, they have accepted. Black students have generally only gone up by maybe two points or less. And in fact, what happens is when we always talk in the district about there's an improvement in the standardized testing, the reality is we're averaging it out. And so what happened after the mayoral takeover was that basically uh, uh, white students and higher income students shot up uh, in terms of performance, while basically low income students and black students basically almost plateaued off. And in fact, if, 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 if white students did not progress any further and high income students did not progress any further, and black students progressed at the same rate they're progressing right now, uh, it would take 132 years for black students to catch up with white students in the city. That's not reform. That is basically building a pipeline to prison and failure for our young folks. And so when we talk about it, it's nothing but hype. Uh, the fact is, is that the administration has intimidated uh, teachers uh, and basically uh, managed top down the whole educational structure so that there's no creativity. They're basically teaching teaching to the test. That's all that's going on, rather than teaching students how to solve problems and how to lead a productive and creative life. And we need to get back to that because the reality is leave no child behind is leaving a lot of children behind. Mr. Uh, I think there certainly is something lacking, and to Reverend Hagler's point, when you have 90% of white students proficient in reading, and you only have 44% and 40% of Hispanics and African Americans who are proficient in reading, there's a real problem there. And it shows that we're not educating our students properly across the entire city. And I would, I would hone in on three things that I think that the DC government could do differently. One, I would ensure the allocation of resources across all the schools is more fair and done in a more reasonable and smart way. Sometimes it's just the loudest voices that are the ones that receive the resources from the DC government. That needs to be looked at closely and it needs to be more transparent. I think secondly, something that I've learned as an ANC commissioner is you have to work closely with the individual educators, principals, and teachers in each neighborhood to solve their specific problems. All schools are different. One might have a transportation issue, another might have um, you know, a parking issue, another might have a lack of resources. You have to work in the individual neighborhood with the specific schools. And the third thing I would say is there is something wrong with the assessment system. There's too much of a focus simply on math and reading scores. We need to also take into account qualitative measures like peer-to-peer -peer reviews, <coughs> student surveys. What are the other measures that we're missing when we, when we assess how our students are performing? How are they getting their health education, not just their reading and math? So I think all of these are very, very important. And the third, the fourth thing that I would say, which is an overarching issue, and before I run out of time here, is the balance that we have between our neighborhood schools and our charter schools. And this is very, very important. Charter schools are here to stay. They're educating over 40% of our students. But we need a fair playing field between charter schools and neighborhood schools. We understand it's a competition. We understand that it's providing great choice. 
but that playing field between those, those two systems needs to be fair and transparent. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Courier, you get to lead the uh, attack. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, we've heard a lot about the disparities in the school system, but we haven't heard the one obvious word, which is that we have a segregated school system. And that's the reality of what exists in Washington, D.C. today and around the country. I think that what we have to do is, and I constantly hear this issue of we need to put more resources into the schools east of the river. You know, the Century Foundation, they did a study. They did a six-year study into this issue exactly. And they looked at schools that on the one hand were all low income that had more money pumped in and schools that were economically integrated. And what they found is that the schools that were integrated did better every single time. They were able to actually cut the achievement gap by half in reading and a third in math. And I think the reality of this situation, and we've seen this across a broad broad spectrum of research is that having schools that are socioeconomically integrated, which in this case certainly means racially integrated, is going to give us better overall outcomes in terms of our school system. We have to equalize not just the public dollars, also the private dollars, and also all those intangibles that come with being wealthy and affluent and that bring extra things that help students to achieve. And I think if we're not really looking at that, we're only looking at it superficially.
should not only teach the test, yes, yes, tests aren't going anywhere. So what we have to figure out is how we bring schools up. I have a five-year-old. He's right there. He's pretty perfect. You can look. Go ahead. He's got a hard but he's pretty perfect. I have to look. I missed you today. Um, and, and here's the reality. I am in this race because of education. I live in Ward 7. There is one public, edu public elementary school where I would feel comfortable sending my son. That is a travesty. I have resources to make different decisions for my kid. I have resources to be able to move him all over this city and a job that is flexible enough to make it happen. I think two things are critically important. One, I think Eugenia is absolutely right that we need to look at figuring out how to create some economic diversity in these schools, but more importantly, we can look at how to do it in communities such that we can raise the entire community up. We talk about education um, and schools as the great solver, and the problem is there are issues all around the school that we have to attack and attack in a meaningful way. When schools are working, parents get better educated too. When schools are working, kids get great jobs, parents get great jobs. Uh, Ms. Silver. I believe in a strong DC public school system. Um, I'm a product of Baltimore City Public Schools, one through 12, so I know public schools work. Here, I think education reform doesn't deal with poverty. We're, we've made a decision that we want neighborhood-based schools, and I agree with Eugene. That means that we have affluent kids going to school with affluent, affluent kids and poor kids going to school Kids. I do think the Boundary Committee tried to address this issue, and I and you know everything shows that socioeconomic diversity in classrooms works. I also think we need more parent involvement and engagement. Parents don't feel like they're part of DCPS, uh, and that's wrong. We're building new schools. Parents are the foundation. I think we need uh, to figure out where the heck we're going with our system. We got half our kids in charters. Half our kids in DCPS, we don't know what the plan is. When I'm on the council, I am going to press the chancellor and the deputy mayor and the mayor, where are we going? I want to build a strong DCPS system. Charters have a place for innovation, but I want a strong DC public school system that's uh, not going anywhere. Uh, Mr. Hager, Mr. Hart, you each have 30 seconds if you want, if you want it. I mean, one of the things is that there is a separate and unequal school system that operates. And some of that, we don't, I know we don't want to take on charter schools, but charter schools have been really put in place to try to privatize public education. You just talk to teachers in charter schools who are being laid off every time a school year ends because they're driving wages to the bottom and they're also penalizing kids because they're looking at the bottom line. That's a real problem when you've got two separate systems that are operating very differently from one another. And that needs to be brought together and unified somehow and have the same standards and the same principles. And every neighborhood needs to have equal schools that are equally and adequately resourced. Sure. I absolutely agree with that, and I think that if you look across the city, we still have that major gap. Uh, a number of the issues have been touched on here. I think we also need to talk more about our teachers and supporting our teachers across the entire city. When I teach and mentor students at the Lou and Anacostia High Schools, and I've been with those students, I see the struggles, the struggle, excuse me, the struggles they're facing, and. It's clear that we need to provide more services in the classroom, tutoring, wraparound services, uh, better facilities. And I think with that, I think we can achieve progress in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more question before we take some from the uh, audience. The District of Columbia clearly lacks school citizenship rights. What approach would you advocate to achieve full citizenship rights for the people of D.C.? Uh, Mr. Hart, would you lead off? What acts would I take to advocate for full citizenship rights for the, for the District of Columbia? What approach would you take as an advocate for mm -hmm. I think ultimately um, it has to be a combination of a couple different approaches. I think one, let's, let's state the, the problem first. There's a real travesty that 650,000 residents of the District of Columbia, our nation's capital, the capital of the free world, don't have voting representation in the United States of America. That is crazy and mind-boggling. And I think it starts with good governance here in DC, increasing budget autonomy, increasing our autonomy here within our own district, 
demonstrating that we have a strong government. It also means advocating Congress very, very actively and pointing out some of the issues and the fact that we are being walked all over with respect to riders, with respect to them interfering with our own legislation. Um, for example, the legalization of marijuana or our own gun laws. I think the second part of this, though, is that we have to work collaboratively. We have to reach out beyond our borders. We have to reach out to other state legislatures. We have to reach out to other state representatives. And we have to make it their cause, too. It can't just be our cause. Because this is a constitutional issue, and it's an issue for our country. So we have to garner the support of our fellow citizens across the country in order to eventually achieve this. Uh, Mr. Jones? Well, I think it starts with a little bit of public discourse. I think it starts with a little bit of a revolution. Uh, one of the things we, we, we talk about is uh, the lack of ability to do things. Well, you know what? We march for Ferguson. We march for Obamacare. We don't march for D.C. State here in voting rights and self-determination. The fact of the matter is, every resident of District Columbia locked arms and stood around the White House and the Capitol. Not one politician was able to leave and do their job. This is our city, not their city. Part of language, but they can get the hell out. I was born here, I was raised here. If they don't want to operate under our rules, it's time for them to go. We give them our tax money, and then we beg them for the ability to do what we need to do. It's time for some real public discourse. We march for everything else in this city but ourselves. Until we stand up and say, we're not paying you taxes. We're not going to put out the fires of your government buildings that you pay, pay for and don't pay taxes on. We're not going to clean your streets at the parks when you have a, a display on the wall and the park service runs out of money. We're not going to give you our best quality police department for your motor case, your international events. Until we stand up and fight for ourselves, we're not going to give a damn about it, and they don't. Mr. Pitts. So I'm going to get real here. You know, I've got 20 years of experience running campaigns. I've worked on voting rights for a long time. You know, Florida, Mississippi, California, Ohio. You know, I've seen people uh, disenfranchised and denied the right to vote across this country, and most quickly here in Washington, you know, D.C. Uh, if we want to get voting rights, one, first, it's 2020. So all the stuff we're talking about is 2020. We're in portion of that. Second, if we're serious about getting voting rights here, then we need to create, you know, a path for ourselves and influence some elections across this country. Because that's the only thing, as Brian <coughs> talked about reaching out, to be serious, Brian, that's the only thing they're going to be concerned with if somehow their election is going to be impaired by what the decisions they make here in, in D.C. So if I'm out and I can hopefully, uh, if I can get an office, I'm going to work with D.C. vote. And interest here in this city to create real power uh, to affect, you know, sometimes marching in the streets and then affecting that way, but also, you know, affecting the political process. You know, we looked at folks in, you know, Congressman of Kentucky, dealing with our gun laws. I worked on uh, gun laws nationally and here to reduce gun laws in, in this city. Uh, we looked at, unfortunately, Andy Harrison and his wife's passage and, you know, the effect on, you know, trying to affect, you know, our policing and our decisions around marijuana. That only happens that we can impact uh, what their decisions are. If we impact their safety in their districts and how they feel safe at home. So, net, I agree with you. Don't make them feel safe here, but don't make them feel safe back at home as well. Uh, Mr. Courier. Yes, well, uh, I think, you know, the, 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 the last two got it 100% right. I mean, obviously, we do need a campaign of civil disobedience that's serious. We do need to build a, a movement that's really a 50 state movement. The question is, though, is how you're going to really make statehood resonate with people in the other 50 states. That's not just some DC based problem. And what we need to start doing to people who are going and lobbying every single day and putting quite a few of their demands, whether they be economic, social, or political, in the context of a deficit of democracy in the United States, whether it's income inequality or uh, uh, the campaign finance reform. So we need to put statehood inside of that same paradigm so that when people go to lobby on these other things, it's not like I have to go on some other day and support D.C. statehood, but that this is going to be a part of my broader program, my social justice program, my democracy equalizing program, D.C. statehood, so we can really build a state-by-state -state movement. And I also want to say, you know, I don't want to just talk about it either. I'm from the Statehood Green Party, and we try to be leaders on things. So I hope everyone will join us on October 1st, and we're going to call for a national statehood calling day. And we certainly are not partisan about it at all. We want everyone to participate, tell your friends and your family, and every single state. We're also trying to get some international support as well. But we have to start, and we have to start now, and we have to really get stated because it's killing us. The first thing I'm going to do, and I encourage other folks to do the same thing, is 
to vote for somebody who's worked on the front lines of the statehood issue. Uh, I was with Congresswoman Norton and other advocates in 2008 when we got the House Voting Rights Bill passed. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get that through, but this is something I've worked on the front lines of for, for many years, something I'm very passionate about. But I think we also have to be very uh, realistic in our understanding. I think that the approaches and, and the recent successes of our delegate, our shadow representatives in D.C. vote have taken over the years to really start building strategic alliances around the country, start coming down hard on folks who step on our home rule. That's the first step, to make sure that they know that we are serious about our rights. But that's something that we have to do first. We have to be serious about it. Uh, but the other thing that we have to understand and taking responsibility ourselves is understanding that, no, we do not have a monopoly on corruption or bad actors, but we are under a microscope. So the integrity of the people that we elect is so important, so much more important than any other place in this country. That's where it starts. <laughs> So, uh, well, first, I'll be happy to join you on October 1st, 15. I'll put it in my calendar. I think we have to set a goal. The goal should be statehood. <laughs> and then I think we have to set a strategy on how to achieve it. But I also think that we have to convince ourselves that we're worthy of statehood. Because I think we are. I think we deserve a voice in our in our House and Senate. And I've not, I not only talk about this, I've participated with Josh Birch, who some, some of you know, who's a fierce statehood advocate. Uh, and, and I think we need to convince ourselves first, honestly. One of the things that I suggested to Josh to do was to start our campaign at home. We're focused on convincing everyone else. I think we need to convince ourselves first. Um, and so one of the things I suggested to Josh, as well as, you know, I live on the hill, I live at 4th and G Northeast, and I go to Results Gym, and uh, before I ran for office and I was in a more regular schedule going to the gym, Al Franken was on my schedule. So we run into some of our congressional representatives all the time. I told Josh, why don't we put up signs at places in our city where our, there our congressional members live, let's be honest, uh, to remind them that we want statehood. So that's something that I've worked with Josh on. But I think also, first, we need to convince our neighbors and friends to take this seriously in our city. I take it seriously. And I think that we need to convince all our neighbors and friends. And then we can set the state-by-state -state strategy of how to get it passed. Ms. Stoughton. So I think we've had a goal to get statehood for some time. I think we have had several strategies to move the statehood conversation for some time. I think what we haven't had are the relationships and the people with the know-how to run a campaign to get statehood. I was with three or four members of Congress just a few weeks ago, and we were talking about the fact that Congress has mandated that we have two non-majority party seats on our council, and they said that was not true. Well, they vote in Congress, unlike our own delegates. So the question for me becomes, who has the relationships to talk to members of Congress beyond the members who represent Maryland and Virginia? That is me. For 15 years of my life, I have walked the halls of Congress as a staffer, as an advocate, as the dirty L word. I've been a lobbyist, too, for some of the most important progressive causes around uh, that, you, that all of us are thinking about, gun safety, education, um, environmental policy issues, and some corporate work as well, um, all progressively aligned, I have you know. Um, so what I want you, so what I want us to be thoughtful about as we think about, I think, uh, I think it's absolutely right that we need to think about a path, we need to really work on electing people who share our perspective and point of view, but we need to identify validators beyond the District of Columbia. We know what the problem is. We know we pay high taxes, we know we have no representation. 